All right. Welcome everybody to the today's collaborative funding for a just transition interview with Don Hall of Transition US and Tobin McKee of Cooperation Humboldt and Transition US and everybody's wearing many hats. Thanks for joining us. And we're, we're going to do a kind of a two prong approach focus to the stories today. Um, with Don speaking more at the national scale and Tobin speaking more at the regional scale about their experience with collaborative funding in, in the movement. And we are hosting these interviews um, through the Thriving Resilient Communities Collaboratory uh, in order to listen to our allies in the field about what is happening in um, collaborative funding, democratic funding, uh, regenerative funding, the, the transformative edges of moving resources together as, as peers, as people in the world. Um, the collaboratory has been um, kind of refining, polishing, birthing a particular form of collaborative funding over the last few years. And we're now at a place where we want to help scale it across and also um, see what else is happening and do what we can to um, catalyze more of it, of, of, of this crucial practice in sharing power and, and moving resources um, to the communities that, that uh, know best what they need. So this is a listening process and sharing process. And by the time we're done, we um, expect to have a, a report on what we've heard, a synthesis, and anybody's welcome to help participate in, in harvesting if you'd like to do that. And we'll also have the first draft of a proposal of, well, what might we do together? What might people want to do um, as, a, as a cohort of networks involved in moving resources as peers in some way. So that's the intention behind the uh, interview today. Then the interview is a, is a positive, fun, appreciative experience that we're gonna enjoy uh, to listen for what's the positive core in what's happening. So I'm excited to hear as a longtime fan of Transition US, um, what is up with Transition US. So, we have a few interview questions that uh, take us on a journey and we'll just start um, maybe with Don first and then Tobin, um, at least for the first one, then we'll see how it goes. Does that sound okay? Sure. All right. Okay, so the first question is um, a simple one and we'd love to hear a success story of your experience, some experience with collaborative funding, something that, that worked, that you're excited to tell the story. And if, if you don't have something that pops to mind, we have some more prompts, but I see you nodding. Do you have something that's popping to mind? Yeah, um, we've done a lot with collaborative funding over the years, including uh, participating with the Thriving Resilient Communities Collaboratory for a number of years. Um, but uh, one thing that we did this year uh, after the pandemic broke out uh, and we started hearing from a lot of uh, transitioners at the grassroots all over this country that, you know, people were losing their jobs, uh, they were incurring medical expenses, um, they were not getting government assistance. Uh, or not getting government assistance fast enough. Uh, and so we created something uh, that we called the Community Resilience Stimulus Fund. Uh, this was partly inspired by the larger uh, share, share My Check movement uh, that a number of organizations participated in. And we basically asked those in our network um, who were doing you know, well financially, uh, despite the pandemic, that were safe and secure and had their basic needs met, uh, to put up some funds. Uh, half went to Transition US uh, to deal with a major hole in our own budget, 
uh, due to having to postpone our 2020 national gathering. Uh, and half of it went into a fund to provide seed grants to local transition initiatives and other related groups around the country. Um, and so we actually ended up uh, raising about $14,000. Uh, we funded 11 projects, um, most between $500 and $1,200. Um, and one of those was Cooperation Humboldt uh, to provide mini gardens uh, in their community. Uh, we also uh, funded a, a group called uh, We Be Gardeners uh, in uh, partnership with Transition Berkeley and the NorCal Resilience Network. Uh, project they're doing called Plants for the People uh, providing fresh and healthy foods for grassroots groups that support food insecure, unhoused, elderly and undocumented individuals who have lost their jobs because of the pandemic. Um, provided a grant to uh, Transition South Pasadena to do a Victory Garden Exchange, Transition Howard County uh, to do a community tool library. Uh, transition Framingham to do a listening project uh, called Honoring the Elders, Memories of a Low Energy Past to Inspire a Low Energy Future. <laughs> uh, and uh, some of our uh, national working groups, uh, including the National Inner Resilience Network uh, that's been doing some fantastic online events throughout this pandemic. Uh, so, a small success, but uh, a success nevertheless. And it's something we hope to do more and more uh, as time goes on. That's great, thank you. Maybe, maybe I'll ask a little bit more about um, this particular story before shifting over to Tobin. So what, um, what are the kind of elements that you would say made this a success? Um, in, in your eyes? Well, I think um, it's our, our social network within transition that we're connected with people, tens of thousands of people all over the country uh, so that, you know, we could call on them for support in a time of need. Um, we've also done a lot of um, work on uh, decentralizing power and democratizing our movement over the past several years, including uh, establishing our National Collaborative Design Council, um, which is made up of grassroots leaders from all over the country, uh, and a couple Transition US staff and a couple members of that Collaborative Design Council came together to review the applications uh, and make decisions about them. Um, in a way that was not just being held by the nonprofit, um, but really by the movement as well. Um, so that cool. kind of participatory nature to it. And also just uh, people out there doing the work, having good projects to fund, ready to go. Good um, point. Right. Great, okay. Thank you. All right, then why don't we shift over to, to Wynn and ask the same question about, you know, a success story that you'd like to share. Uh, yeah, thank you. And this little success story is, I'm, I'm glad that you're, it fits perfectly with the, the idea of collaborative funding. So I'm glad that you're asking this question this way. Um, out here in Humboldt County, we have a foundation called the Humboldt Area Foundation, which is really behind a lot of the incredible work that all the local nonprofits are doing. And they did two things, one before uh, the pandemic and one during the pandemic. Before the pandemic, a group of local investors came together to form something called the Donor Circle. Uh, they just wanted Humboldt Area Foundation to manage the fund and to provide grants to organizations um, 
that were having positive impacts on the community. And the donor circle was, a, uh, was the, one of the first uh, large sources of funding for all of Cooperation Humboldt's projects. And then during uh, the pandemic, Humboldt Area Foundation put together something similar to what Don described, which was the COVID response fund, which was a community generated uh, fund that pulled in a lot of money and supported an incredibly wide array of, uh, array of programs, including Cooperation Humboldt's own COVID response um, efforts. And from those two sources of funding, uh, the care and wellness team at Cooperation Humboldt was able to implement our community health worker collaborative program in a way that enables us to pay um, our participants in the development of that process. Uh, and what that means is that the, the community health worker collaborative is there to create community health worker programs in underserved communities. But rather than providing those services, the program cultivates members of those communities to become the community health workers and involves those community members from the ground up in the development of their own programs. So using the funds from, that were collaboratively uh, gathered by Humboldt Area Foundation through the donor circle and through the COVID-19 response fund, we're able to pay our participants in the community for their input into the development of their own programs. So rather than relying on the free labor of the underserved people um, or coming in from the outside with a program that's designed for but not by them, we're able to pay uh, the participants directly for their participation and contribution to the program itself. And that ultimately um, feeds back into the broader vision um, held by Humboldt Area Foundation and by Cooperation Humboldt, which is to produce self-sustaining autonomous uh, groups that uh, not only fund themselves, but uh, are serving their communities directly from their communities. And uh, the the example that I can give concrete example is we're working with a group of five uh, women, they're Hmong refugees who live in Eureka, and they're creating a community health worker program. We're able to not only pay them for their contribution to the project, but also our other collaborative partner at Native American Pathways, who has a successful program that she created herself. Um, and so she's serving as a mentor to the Hmong women. And the, the role of Cooperation Humboldt is really um, to connect these two uh, groups of wonderful people and support them in their program development as uh, autonomous and self-funding organizations. Wow. I could say more, but I'm just <laughs> leaving it to you. Well, I'll, you know, you can say more, but maybe in the context of how, what, what allowed this work to be possible? What elements, what assets and relationships and, and resources made this all able to come together? Yeah, I think the, the key defining element is probably that from the beginning and consistently throughout our work at Cooperation Humboldt, we have made it very clear in both principle and practice that we are here to serve the community and not our own organization. And a lot of what we do, in fact, I could almost say most of what we do is inherently collaborative in nature and interorganizational. And not only interorganizational, but also involving um, people at, in, as individuals, nonprofits, colleges and universities, and uh, government agencies and for-profit businesses, all, all working together uh, toward shared goals uh, in, with the spirit of serving the underserved in whatever way possible and developing an economic basis which is independent from outside sources. So a self-sustaining, regenerative, bioregionally focused economic basis. And 
it is those those relationships organizationally and interpersonally that have allowed us to establish trust uh, uh, in, in, in areas where uh, trust has been difficult to establish or has been violated repeatedly historically, as well as larger scale trust among the really powerful and positively influential organizations like our largest healthcare provider and our colleges and universities who have over the years seen that we um, are there for them and there for the people that they serve rather than just being out to boost and elevate our own work and our own image. Mm. Thank you. Can you give me a sense of what kind of um, resources in terms of money were required to, to do the um, Community Health Worker Collaborative, this ballpark? Well, right now we're working with a budget. We, we uh, received a, a substantial donation from a local group of physicians in addition to the funding from Humboldt Area Foundation and the donor circle. And that funding uh, is in the range of, put it all together, $40,000. Because of the size of the project, that is um, just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. We have, mm -hmm. uh, a, the collaborative is a collaborative of 12 organizations, including all three local native tribes and the Hmong community and the area's largest healthcare provider and community college. So because of the size of the project, um, that is just the beginning of the funding that's necessary. And, and you know, on the topic of collaborative funding, another aspect of this is the size and depth of the, that, that particular collaborative project. What we recognized right away was that if we establish formal partnerships uh, across a broad sector of participation, then things like foundation funding and things like state and gov uh, government funding are much more within our reach than if we just represent ourselves as a, a separate organization. So all of the funding that comes in to the collaborative goes to the collaborative not to Cooperation Humboldt. Um, it goes to the direct participation of all of our collaborative partners, each according to their need uh, as the program uh, continues to grow. Sounds uh, transformative and, and familiar. <laughs> I guess that's kind of how we, how we roll too. Um, and it's, it is, it's, it's not business as usual, is it? No, oh, and you know, first, for a lot of folks, it takes a little bit of a moment of learning to say, wait, what's in it for you? When, what's in it for you? How do you maintain control? And we're saying, oh, no, we, we share uh, the, we share the funds and we share the responsibility through distributed leadership and democratic process. And that continues to be surprising, refreshing, sometimes even a little bit um, confusing at the beginning to say, no, really, this is truly collaborative. And then once that's recognized, the enthusiasm and the level of intrinsic motivation goes way up. And I think intrinsic motivation, aside from needing funding, projects need intrinsic motivation from the participants. And mm -hmm. that really does make that uh, difference. Economic democracy and government governance, self-governance democracy, both really, really uh, increase that sense of uh, intrinsic motivation for everybody involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm remembering some comments for people uh, who were, getting RFPs, heard how we, how the uh, 
TRC process worked and they just looked at us and they said, you're crazy. <laughs> a, a really beautiful in, kind in of In a good crazy. way. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. So now that we're kind of up to the, the present, let's um, move into visioning mode where I'm going to invite everybody to just pause for a moment, maybe just sit quietly for a minute and imagine if you had three wishes right now that uh, supported the success of your next collaborative funding initiative, what would those wishes be? So just invite you to sit for a minute and dream into that. So why don't we, since Tobin's been talking for a while, why don't we move back to Don and we'll just keep the, the circle going. Yeah, I'm just, I don't think we have any shortage of great projects to fund. Uh, and we know how to do this um, and the, the kind of, you know, democratic collaborative culture within our movement is pretty well developed uh, already. So, um, yeah, I think maybe one, two, and three would be more funds. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just just to be perfectly honest, right. um, you know, sometimes I think about you know, how much of our money, you know, even well-meaning people, you know, have invested in the stock market versus what they give to charity. And they may not even know where that money is going. It may be funding deforestation. It may be defunding, it may be funding weapons. It may be funding fossil fuel exploration. Um, and I think we will see a change um, in funding levels when people come to realize that, um, you know, we need to really um, have our money support what our values are. Um, and I think this is, you know, something else that I've noticed lately is that there's uh, a massive generational wealth transfer starting to happen between the baby boomer generation and Gen X, millennials, Gen Z. Um, and those folks uh, that are, you know, receiving the bounty of the wealthiest generation in the history of the world um, are going to have some really important choices to make about where that money goes. Um, and so I think if we can, you know, really capture people's imagination around the world that, that we are creating together, not just that we could create together, but we are creating together um, and show people a real alternative to the dead end destructive status quo uh, that is you know, more and more up in our face every year. Um, then we will be able to greatly accelerate uh, this work both in terms of, you know, people getting involved, um, you know, and, and dedicating, you know, a good portion of their life to, to this work. Uh, and, 
with their with their money and other resources, uh, really putting them to work in these grassroots movements. And I guess one last thing I'd say is, um, you know, sometimes the the big uh, kind of policy level or um, yeah, the biggest biggest initiatives get the most money um, because they're very visible because maybe donors feel like if this will, if this one thing would just happen, uh, it would make the world so much better. And I think that's a kind of uh, mentality that we may need to shift is that the best answers don't always come from the top. And if we're only funding large scale solutions from the top down, we're funding uh, solutions that reinforce the uh, power dynamics in our current society rather than taking advantage of this opportunity to, um, to change those power dynamics, to have the power more in the hands of the people and solutions created bottom up tailored to local communities, to their specific needs, to their specific um, culture and resources uh, and have those be much more widely distributed. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of potential for, for change right now. I think because we see, you know, record-breaking wildfire and hurricane season after record-breaking wildfire and hurricane season, you know, what's been happening with our politics lately, what's, you know, been revealed about race in this country. Um, I think people are starting to get that we, we just can't continue down this path that the status quo is not good enough. Mm -hmm. That was profound. Thanks, Don. <laughs> Oof. Okay, Tobin, how about your, your three wishes? Well, uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, Don's here to talk about the bigger picture and I'm here to talk about the local picture and, and his answers compared to what I'm going to say will reveal that nicely. I thought so concretely about our, my three wishes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, what I came up with is, you know, it sounds a bit selfish compared to what Don uh, just shared, but I think it is the responsibility of the local initiatives to do the work necessary to uh, obtain and create a network of local funding, locally sourced funding. So that's what I'm going to talk about. We have a couple of efforts and in, uh, in process. And when I think about what my wishes are, they are all that, that these, these in process efforts come to fruition. Uh, the first one is that we have uh, some connection to the California endowment and we would really like to see um, Humboldt County become the next recipient of their, uh, of that endowment. Uh, it, Santa Ana was the last recipient and the work that happens is happening down there as the result of that large influx of available funding has been incredible. So we are, we're hopeful that the, the next bioregion that the California endowment supports will be Humboldt County. Um, and and uh, that is about relationship building and, and, and about uh, creating this network of interrelated organizational uh, relationships that go far uh, beyond our own uh, simple and small organizational interests um, that I mentioned before. Uh, the second wish that I have is that uh, our local financial institutions adopt and create new funding solutions for uh, worker-owned cooperatives for startup and for transition, uh, for conversion from existing businesses to worker-owned cooperatives. There are 
financial instruments out there. There are lending agencies that support that. What, what, what we'd like to see is that our local agencies develop those financial instruments. And so we're working and in conversation with them about that. Uh, and the third, um, oh boy, now I have to remember what it was. Mm. Pardon me for the pause, I had it, but then Dawn's uh, <laughs> wonderful. That's okay. Uh, um, give me a second, ask a follow-up question. Yeah, and the third okay. One I'll tell you what, we could, do, we could do that because we're, we're just headed for the last of the interview questions right now. And mm. it's, it's a especially fun one. Oh, I got it. Okay. Uh, so it turns out that the donor circle that I mentioned before is now starting to think about becoming an investing group instead. And, and we and other organizations who have been the recipient of their support in the past are now in conversation with some of the people from that donor circle and, and others to create opportunities for local area investors to divest from larger, uh, larger investments and, and, and put their money into community centered projects, similar to what they're doing as the donor circle, but with, for, with the benefit of it being an investment rather than a grant, a donation. So yeah, that's another dream that I have come through that that investing group comes to form as we've seen in other areas. And I think you've done some work on that as well. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very grounded and very exciting too. <laughs> I, I'm like, I want that. I want that to come to life myself in Humboldt and everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So just let's wave a magic wand and say that Don's wishes come true and Tobin's wishes come true. And it's a year from now. It's the end of 2021. Yeah, and Ben's waving. Yes, we're waving wands here. So imagine that you have been part of a cohort of networks moving money together over the last year and um, you know, learning from each other. Uh, whatever you think might help your wishes come true. And so our, we're wondering, do you have any um, advice or wishes for what being part of that cohort would look like? What difference could it make for you? What would you be excited to participate in that you think um, would be valuable for what you're doing? And I'm gonna be fascinated to hear the national and regional um, comparison here too. Does either one of you want to go first here? I mean, I have some simple thoughts off the top of my head. I, I think all of us here uh, are pretty vigilant about uh, making sure that we're doing our best not to reinvent the wheel. And the things that you know, the wishes that I have, I know are things that have happened elsewhere and happened successfully. And for me to share and have, an, have a network that can and will share uh, what uh, successes they have would really, really save everybody time and effort uh, to break out of the local isolation and enter into a broader conversation that's not just, that goes beyond story sharing and into direct tool sharing and oh, really, really yeah. save us from all, I love learning the hard way. That's how I learn the best, but time is of the essence. And so I, I would really look forward to on the ground, really practical uh, tool sharing and, and relationship sharing that can help everybody uh, 
achieve what they want without having to do as much legwork. Great, thank you. And, and feel yep. free as more pop up, but let's see if anything's popped up for Don in the meantime. Yeah, I would second what Tobin just said. Um, actually, Cooperation Humboldt is probably one of the better resourced initiatives that's part of our network. Um, many transition initiatives out there are completely volunteer run, you know, a zero budget or maybe, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year to pay for printing expenses and venue rentals and things like that. Um, so, you know, even, even a grant of a thousand or two thousand dollars can be huge for groups like that, that run very lean, um, are powered by volunteer support. Uh, it can really make a breakthrough difference for those groups. And I think, you know, uh, what's more sustainable than, you know, funneling all that money into one organization and then putting it out there is teaching these groups uh, how to fundraise for themselves. Um, a diverse set of funding strategies, I think, you know, earned income, social entrepreneurship, uh, grants, sponsorships, donations. Uh, for some folks, you know, they're starting from a very basic level. A lot of people who, you know, get into doing this work may have never done anything like this before in their lives. And they've shown you know, tremendous courage to step into the, the breach where, you know, nobody else is showing up. And, you know, they have to learn all sorts of skills, fundraising and communication and governance and project management and all these things. And uh, yeah, a lot of them could use uh, much more help with fundraising um, and yeah, yeah. And also, uh, for a number of them, fiscal sponsorship is a really important thing as well. Uh, because a lot of these are just community groups that don't have their own 501c3 status and they might be intimidated about going for that. Um, so you know, that's something we've started to talk about, whether we could uh, be a fiscal sponsor nationally uh, for groups that are part of our network or could refer, um, you know, have a network of vetted fiscal sponsors in maybe every state around the country uh, that understand community resilience building and are supportive of this because yeah, when you pick a fiscal sponsor, you're giving them a lot of legal authority uh, over your organization. And it's important to have a, an organization that you're working with that really understands uh, and supports that work. Um, so those are, those are a few thoughts off the top of my head, things that would be uh, useful. Can I just bounce off what you said, Don, because you reminded me. Uh, Cooperation Humboldt wants to do that, Don, um, within a mentorship model. Uh, I think I, we talked about this before, but you've reminded me. And I, when I answered the question, I said, oh, well, I want information sharing so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But what Don raises is the need for uh, this mentorship to happen. And, you know, like we are... Uh, one of the more well-funded in initiatives simply because we are, we've done the work and we have the team that can do the work. But we, we now we're at a point where we have paid staff that can literally give some of its time to other initiatives um, to, to, to do exactly what Don just said. And, and the way that I see it is that, you know, if we spend the time to do that, it's not just 
it's not lost staff hours that I would spend not working on Cooperation Humboldt specific pro projects. It is exactly why we're here, which is to build the movement and to build relationships. And so, you know, we, we do need to reorient the, the notion of, uh, of what work is worth doing and, and to recognize that giving of our expertise to other, uh, other movement organizers is valuable not only to us and to them, but to the movement as a whole. So redefining what that value of that time spent um, really opens up and makes, makes the, the resources shared rather than um, siloed or, or owned by any one particular organization. This is like serendipity here. This is just great. <laughs> Why is it serendipity? Explain. I mean, just the, the I'm loving the, the, you know, dynamics between the national view and the regional view. And here's the regional hub that's, you know, further along and gosh, maybe they can mentor the movement and your perspective that that, you know, one of the things that the, the TRC collaboratory members say is that we work for the movement. And, and that's, you know, you just, you're living it. So, and um, there's a, a practical on the ground uh, implication of that, that, you know, we're trying to think about as we're structuring this lab you know, could the lab have funding to pay part of Humboldt staff time to mentor the movement in a class, for example, um, in, in fundraising? We've, that's one of the possibilities that we've discussed, you know, to, to set up um, classes mentoring small groups on specific themes that um, people want to learn. But not every organization has the bandwidth to volunteer that expertise. So, Whew. well, um, we were, we've come to a place on the journey where the, uh, the questions, the, the, the planned questions are uh, behind us. And now we can just um, spend a, a few minutes just kind of digesting this and hearing reflections from the from Ben and from me as the interview team and, and talk a, amongst us a little bit and then open it up to include Dita and Mark. Hi, Mark. Welcome. Uh, for the rest of the time. And Ben, um, would you like to begin sharing any thoughts that came up for you as you were listening? Thanks, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of validation of kind of some of the, the core um, elements of the hypothesis we're coming into this with. That, you know, for example, that there is this existing well-established network of trust and relationships and you know that relationships with individuals within communities with initiatives with anchor institutions between you know across scales local to national and you know to global transition is a global movement too of course um and that that represents an infrastructure that's capable of both generating and moving far more money than it than is currently flowing through it. And that we're we're at a point, a transition point, no pun intended, where we can call for those resources. And 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 you know, to the extent that the capacity needs to be further developed to be able to handle them as they come in, um, that that we're ready to do that too. Um, the generational transfer of wealth that you talked about, Don, has been a theme that's come up. Um, a number of times and including just in the last you know, today earlier today and in the conversation i was having um with someone who's not you know plugged into this lab at all but is basically you know kind of co 
it's a co-arising of a very similar noticing of what's possible, slightly different focus on, on, the, on dialogue as kind of the key leverage point that might be, um, that might be used to connect up the, the funders to the work that needs to be done and to, to manage the, the process of, of tapping into collective wisdom for where that money flows. Um, so it just, it all feels very alive and, and ripe in this moment. That's, that's what I'm getting mostly is a lot of validation for that. And I would love to see our conversation together now, maybe go a little bit into some, you know, visioning of more concrete elements of, of the design of this lab. You know, what would, you know, the, the last question was designed to kind of put you in a place of imagining you'd participated in a hypothetical lab over the course of 2021 and you know how what actually happened and how did it serve you and I'd love to sort of you know dig into some of those questions a little more um hear your reflections too Leslie maybe before we do that but but for example one of the one of the core design challenges I think is how we work across these levels especially if we're in making this a global um engagement which which we have said we want to do um, to, to, you know, to bring, have the global South, for example, be a significant part of, of this, um, of this inquiry and of the, of the, of whatever we are able to do to support more resources flowing in, in this collaborative way. Um, but it seems very tricky, you know, like in the way that, for example, you know, Don, you're like, yeah, more money and, and we can move that out. And Tobin, you're saying, well, we really need to resource it locally. And, and there's, you know, which makes at a core that that makes sense, right? That we want as much distributed, locally resilient or bioregionally resilient capacity as possible. And what is the role for larger pools of money coming from the top down? And how does that, you know, not have a kind of a colonizing effect, even with the best of intentions? Um, that that seems like a really interesting question. And, and, and as we imagine who's in this lab, you know, how much of it are, are initiatives that are operating at, at various levels across the, the spectrum of scale. So those are some things I'm left with. I'd like to get into the thoughts on uh, the, what the lab could look like more practically too. Um, so let me just keep this short and say that I'm, I'm, also hearing a lot of um, synergy with the ideas that we've been um, talking with. And I'm, I really appreciate that we have the national and the regional perspective here. Um, I hold both and have been in conversations with many people in the San Francisco Bay Area who are active in what we're calling bioregions, um, North Bay, South Bay, East Bay, that's not I mean, we don't know what the language yet because bioregion means different things to different people, but how do we um, share resources across scales and create structures for sharing those resources that are based on existing trusted relationships, but can also channel um, money to the bottom up groups. Um, and we're, I think we're figuring it out. And the more we can uh, think together and share uh, what's working, um, the more we don't have to waste time reinventing the wheel. So that's really, I'm really motivated to participate in a lab like this because I'm already learning so much um, from the, the interviews that we've had, I can really see the value for what I'm thinking about, even imagining what happens or designing. I'm going to say designing because we're, we're working on it in the, in the Bay Area. So one of the challenges, and, and this, is, this is something that I've talked about probably more with Caroline in Transition US, is that we don't want to be doing something at the tier CC level that is better done at the transition US level. I mean, we've got networks of networks of networks, right? So what's the right relationship of what happens where? And so 
particularly as Transition US is a global network, you know, I'm curious what sort of kind of rhythm of what sort of activities would you find useful in a lab, Don? You know, maybe what that might work well with what you're already doing. Does that question make sense? And I know that you're just moving into this uh, role. So you're probably reinventing what you're doing too. Yeah, we're uh, with our year end fundraising campaign this year. Uh, we're really working, for, I think, for the first time to engage transition groups around the country uh, in doing their own campaigns and providing resources uh, to support them in doing that, That's both a kind of guide to how to run a year end fundraising campaign. Uh, and also uh, online fundraising event that they can use to, you know, get their supporters uh, pumped up. Um, so, yeah, just a thought about the, you know, the different levels of scale. I think, um, you know, as with food and the economy, um, energy. Uh, we want to keep it local as much as possible. Um, that, uh, you know, if transition, I think the, the real sustainable strategy over the long term is to provide local leaders with uh, the tools, the mentoring, the knowledge, the skills uh, that they need to resource their work. Um, you know, we are doing some of this collaborative fundraising and seed funding as, you know, Transition Network on the international level has done for us because we're all under-resourced at this point. Uh, at every level from the, from the bottom to the top, um, you know, Transition US currently has three staff members working between 20 and 32 hours a week uh, to support a national network of over 70 different groups, local initiatives, regional hubs, and uh, national working groups. Um, so we have less staff than, uh, than an average shift at McDonald's uh, to do this incredibly important and urgent uh, work. And, you know, I think that points to the need for a kind of all of, a, all of the above strategy right now to bring more money into these movements. Um, and, you know, I think we see it happening more and more um, more collaboration around grants, around uh, crowdfunding, um, local investment clubs popping up all over the country to support local social enterprises. Um, but um, yeah, I think we just need, we need more of it all and, you know, any, any resources that the TRCC can provide uh, in terms of, you know, bringing all these different networks together to, to have these conversations, to learn from each other, to share, as Tobin said, you know, tools with each other so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, I think is, is very valuable. And, um, you know, over the years, it's been extremely valuable uh, for, for myself and for Transition US as a whole to be part of the TRCC network. And, you know, it has led to some, some real tangible collaborations with, you know, organizations like Shareable and News Stories. Uh, we were collaborating with Post Carbon Institute before this, but 
um, you know, deepening that relationship as both members of the TRCC. Uh, and really learning about, you know, all the amazing work that's going on out there in this uh, movement of movements. So, you know, even just the networking aspect of the TRCC, I think is, is something very uh, worth continuing. Thanks, Don. Do oh, you? I had a thought. Oh. Go ahead. I, I... Oh, I, I, I had a thought, Leslie. You had mentioned, you know, this vision of of a larger national and international funding uh, coming. How does it? How does it work its way into the local level? And it made me think about the, the nature of the meritocracy um, where, you know, if you, have, if you have donors, if you have investors, if you have philanthropists, everybody wants to see some kind of return on their investment. And everybody wants to see the on the ground work be successful uh, and show, you know, uh, its positive impact. But in order to do that so-called successful work, the group doing the work has to have not only the funding, but the history of being supported that backs up this particular kind of measurable success. And because the people who are in the greatest need don't have that history, um, then it's difficult to step into the, that stream the, uh, and, and that meritocracy and to say, you know, we are able to um, produce those results. We, ha we, have, we have what we need, not just funding, but um, capacity building. And so I think, I think in order for uh, a broader uh, funding stream to work and even for the local funding streams to work, particularly when you're thinking about return on an investment, whether or not that's capital or uh, social capital return on investment, capacity building has to be part of the, the, the foundation. And so not just ask, you know, not just asking groups to prove that they can through like, you know, I'm so used to writing grants where you, you have to prove that you can, you have to prove in advance that you can pull this off. Um, but actually to be able to say, no, actually we can't and here's why. Um, and that's the level of support that we need. Um, so I think in order to avoid the pitfalls of the meritocracy that uh, tends to support privilege capacity building needs to be inbuilt to the process itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, got it, thanks. I'm reminded of the story of Sarah, the, the recycling business in, uh, in Dorchester and Roxbury that um, has been featured in some of the other work we've supported, the Ujima project and how there were, there were there was at least one if not two failures prior to that you know being launched and it, and the relationships that were built in that were kind of you know it was composting of all of that failure that created this rich soil out of which this really cool kind of closed loop recycling thing that you know where they're they're getting the food waste from within the community to use to compost to actually fertilize the community gardens that are then growing the food that are being that's also being eaten within the community um, so to, it, I, what I'm hearing from you, Tobin, is a whole shift in mentality that says, you know, what, there are a lot of things that matter and we're in a time of such uncertainty and transformation that actually among the least important things might be proving that you can do this in, in you know, or at least that, that can't be the only thing that we're, you know, and especially if we're, if we're wanting to resource, um, less privileged groups, although, you know, that's, that's an example of, of, a place where those those relationships often do exist. I mean, if the core infrastructure is connections and relationship, they they may be richer in that than than many wealthier communities. Also, 
You were going to jump in, Leslie. I'm sorry. I spoke out of turn. No, that's okay. Um, that was that. That is. I remember that story too. That's cool. I want to make sure that we have time to weave Dita and Mark in here too. So um, maybe why don't we, why don't we do that and uh, ask Mark and Dita to share any reflections or questions that you have for um, Tobin and Don, and then um, as we get closer uh, towards the end, we'll go back for some. Uh, closing remarks and wrap up. Is there another way you'd like to do that, Ben? Oh, that do you, good. Do you I mean, want I to go into small like, groups? This is a pretty small group. No, let's, let's, I think we're small and we stay together. But I mean, you know, for me, it's like, you know, you two are representing the, in some ways, the international component too, Dita, in about to move to Totnes, the, the, the place where the transition movement was born. Um, and Mark with all of your connections to the global south. So I think, you know, we've had this very US centric conversation here, but it is part of our vision that this, this lab that we're doing this discovery process now to try to um, gather information, you know, in order to, to, to design something that will really work across all those scales, that your reflections and input at any level, you know, as, as witnesses or as potential collaborators or whatever uh, would be really nice to hear. Thank you. Um, I, I just barge in um, in representation of the UK. <laughs> um, well, I, I think the first thing I, I would like to say is, is I think uh, Tobin was saying at the beginning, like people asking, what, how, what do you mean that this works like that? And, and it, it, from my perspective, it just sounds extraordinary what, what both Don and Tobin were talking about and sharing, and I'm 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 quite new to to listen to to that side of of the world and transition, and it, it just sounds like it's working really well. Um, what I'm here, I'm not involved directly with the transition movement in the UK, but I do know several people uh, working in there, and what I hear and what I feel is is, is a tiredness and. Um, a struggle, particularly when resources are are in the table. So I guess my question is, how do you how you do how do you deal with the human part of the decision making for the resource distribution? Is there is there a, a, I mean, are you beyond the conflict uh, part? Is it working like amazingly, or or is there something? That you actively do to to prevent those things from from derailing the the movement. Yes, I heard a couple things in there that I could respond to. Um, you know the kind of limited amount of collaborative fundraising that we've done, whether it be you know. Uh, scholarships, raising funds for scholarships for people to attend conferences, um, whether that be do, uh, doing uh, joint grant proposals with local transition initiatives uh, around the country that are working on similar themes, uh, whether that be the Community Resilience Stimulus Fund. Um, you know, I think there's there's a recognition that um, you know we're we're asking people to apply, and we can't fulfill every request that we receive, um, and that we are doing our best. Um, I think that oftentimes people don't realize. Um, they think Transition US is a much bigger organization than it is. Um, and so we just, I think it's really important being transparent uh, about, you know, what our, what our current capacity is and to, you know, involve grassroots representatives in the movement, in the decision-making so that, uh, you know, 
folks don't feel like we're, we're playing favorites, uh, that we have a transparent process that we're going through. Um, but I think I also heard in there, Dita, if I'm not mistaken, you know, something kind of almost cultural uh, in the transition movement around our attitudes towards money, uh, which has been a really important theme for me. I mean, a lot of us coming into this work, um, you know, are coming into this work seeing that the hierarchical uh, money and power driven structures of the past have uh, been a major cause of this mess that we find ourselves in. And uh, in creating the massive inequalities that we see in our society and don't want to participate in them. So I think there's some kind, sometimes a kind of uh, almost instinctual backlash against anything that involves money or structure because we really acutely see the potential for abuses in those realms. I mean, we've seen it over and over and over again throughout history. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, as we mature, uh, as we, you know, try to fulfill the kind of mission that we have in transition, uh, building more resilient and regenerative communities uh, in which, you know, we're bringing everybody together to re-envision re and rebuild our future, uh, that, you know, these things are necessary tools. You know, we can't create an alternative to uh, our current energy system. Uh, you know, if we're all just doing this, you know, after work and on the weekends as volunteers, you know, we need, we need to find ways of structuring our organizations and working with money uh, that are both highly effective and that reflect our deepest values. Um, so I think that, you know, we just hosted a conversation uh, a few weeks ago on resourcing our movement with grassroots leaders from all over the country. And I think this is starting to change, at least here in the US, uh, this recognition that, you know, money and structure are not inherently bad um that yes we do need to be careful about how we approach these topics but we have to approach these topics if we really want to create the scale of change uh, that our situation demands and dita uh following on that from don thank you so much don um you know, a lot of the points that you raised are about the structures of money and power and the way that we approach that, you know, in Cooperation Humble, Didi, you asked, are there things that you are actively doing um, to change those dynamics? And, and at Cooperation Humble, we've actually flipped the script uh, in, in our internal organizational structure so um, that what we have are autonomous program areas that, um, uh, let's say, you know, Cooperation Humboldt gets a grant. The first thing that the board staff and core leadership does is to ask the program areas, what are your needs so that we can distribute the grant funds um, equitably. Uh, at that point, once those funds are distributed equitably based on the input of the program areas, those program areas have complete autonomy over the funding. If a program area itself gets funded, like uh, for example, the community health worker program brings in money, then that, that program area has full autonomy over how that money is used. And so we end up sending our proposal to the board because it is actually a real nonprofit organization. The board does have that fiscal responsibility, but they aren't the ones, neither the board nor the executive director are the ones making those decisions. It is the people doing the work who are making the decisions. And, and, and the board has to give its 
thumbs up on proposals, but it's different than approval. It's more like, you know, using the language of sociocracy, it, we do not see that these decisions that you're about to make will do any harm to the organization or anybody else. Um, and, and so by, by purposefully making a, a structural template within the organization of self-governance, autonomy, and um, horizontal distributed leadership, we have changed the dynamic and empowered the individuals who are actually doing the work on the ground. Thanks. Maybe we should let Mark have, have the floor here for to hear his voice here. I must apologize for missing the first 30 minutes. So maybe my question has already been addressed. Um, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, the more I, I, um, I hear people who have been doing this work for a while, um, the more I can see the real impact or the, let me say this, refer, rephrase it a little bit, the real meaning of uh, uh, impact investing and regenerative investing. Um, and, and I guess I have, I have a couple of questions. The first one is um, how to disseminate this work. Is it, is it by looking at uh, um, things like DAO, decentralized um, autonomous organizations and, and all the um, um, softwares and developers that are working on, 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 on these principles. And um, is there, are you seeing an issue with um, opening this type of um, exploration and experience with um, uh, more diverse communities, brown, black people. I can take that first shot again. Um, Thank you. Yeah, good questions. Um, so, I think the most powerful tool that we've discovered for you know, really disseminating um, this work is through storytelling. Um, through telling the stories of real people and real projects that are happening on the ground in local communities, you know, how how that's transformed uh, people's lives for the better uh, on the individual level, on the community level. Um, and sharing those stories as far and wide as possible. So we do that. Um, right now we're in the midst of a year long online national campaign we're calling from what is to what if. And we've been collecting these stories from all over the US uh, to share through our communications channels with our immediate network, um, through our website, through our e-newsletters, through social media, um, but then also um, potentially compiling them into a book, a podcast series, um, we came out with a, a book called 10 Stories of Transition in the US last year um, and looking to potentially do something like that again and to uh, get some coverage in the, in the national media uh, as well for these stories so that people can actually see this because th these movements that we're a part of are, too often uh, in completely invisible uh, to the average person uh, who, you know, just, uh, you know, gets all their news through corporate media. 
uh, we don't see many of these stories reflected. Um, so, so getting them out there uh, as far and wide as possible. And we're calling the third phase of this what is to what if campaign stories to action. So um, it's not just telling the stories, but we're also uh, selecting uh, four key ones to uh, present a webinar that goes into greater depth about their story and then to lead an action learning cohort for people to adapt and replicate the, that project in other communities. Um, but we could still use more tools. I mean, one, uh, one I've been really thinking about is uh, metrics uh, for local initiatives. Uh, and this can be a very diff difficult thing um, for local initiatives to do on their own, to, to be able to really articulate what their impact is. Um, you know, more subjective impacts, how they're actually totally transforming people's lives. You know, how do we, how do we measure that? <laughs> uh, all the way to, you know, more conventional metrics like carbon emissions. Uh, how does a local group measure their impact on climate change? Uh, that's, that can be very challenging as well. Um, and I think there was one other thing that I was going to say, but uh, I'll let Tobin go and see if it comes back to me. Thanks, Don. Um, so Mark, if I was to think of one thing, I, I think I would have to come back to capacity building um, and in particular in working with underserved populations and oppressed populations. Um, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but I'll try to give some concrete examples. Uh, we're working with uh, the Hmong community and we're also working with um, the Hoopa, uh, Hoopa Tribal Organization. And uh, one of the conversations that uh, happened was, you know, how, how are we going to communicate with each other and communicate with the community about the project that we're working on? That was a recommendation of a wide variety of digital platforms. And one of the uh, participants, you know, raised her hand and said, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, we don't use the internet. If you want to get a message out, you just have to tell my cousin. And that is not a joke, right? It's funny, but it's not a joke. Um, and on the other side, uh, we're working with a community that not only doesn't use the internet, but, but does, doesn't have the bandwidth on their phones to have Zoom meetings. Um, and, and what I'm really noticing is that the, 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 the architecture, the infrastructure of our programming, of our outreach, and of the ways that we're designing things in our minds um, are are invariably reflections of our background and our education. Um, and, you know, there's a report that was just published recently that the, um, that the, the, the tribal people in our area have received the worst quality education of anybody in the county. And that is like, that, that's a very a clear measure. And um, what, what that says is that those people have spent their lives developing a completely different kind of intelligence and capacity than people who have, uh, uh, you know, what's called a better education. So life and the resilience and the community building and all the skills um, that people who don't have access to excellent education develop, those are the skill sets that, um, that they bring to the table. And when we're only thinking in terms of white space and, and, and only thinking in terms of the platforms and the ways of communicating and working together that we're used to, it's inherently exclusive sometimes to the degree that it becomes a total barrier to entry or completely inaccessible or invisible um, to the people who, who need it most and have the skills that, uh, that are really missing from the equation. Um, and so, not only is it about capacity building, but it's also about recognizing different capacities and recognizing different skill sets and different 
um, ways of operating at a fundamental level that 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 without real genuine intercultural exchange, we cannot pretend to understand or even begin to imagine. And so it, it takes a, a deep trust, uh, humility, and a beginner's mind to enter into um, collaboration and communication in new spaces where you're completely unfamiliar without imposing that uh, worldview on others. Uh, and, and I think training and capacity building and movement leaders it, for uh, this is essential. Wow. Well, with humility, I'm going to uh, say it's time for us to be coming to a close. This has been so rich, so full. Um, thank you so much for participating, everybody. I wish we could go on forever, but we we're gonna we're gonna continue to harvest and um, have stay in touch because we're we're connected. I I'm wondering, does either Don or Tobin have any um, closing? remarks or thoughts that you want to share before we uh, turn it over to Ben? Are you feeling complete? No, just thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, I appreciate the, the invite from Ben and Leslie and Dita and Mark for being here. And, Tobin. and when we watch this uh, a year from now, you know, we'll, we'll all congratulate each other for predicting uh, the future. <laughs> if we had more time as a part of the, the process where you look back from that future and say, well, what were some of the steps that we took, you know, in, in December <laughs> and January? Um, so, but we're going to be thinking about those steps and, and, and you'll certainly be in the loop for them. So. Yeah, this was great. I loved the, the symmetry that we had across multiple levels with the six of us really here. Um, so thank you all. Thank you.